we have been talking about tardless closure. We touched upon that in last two days, mainly on the first day in the second lecture. And as I mentioned, many of the things which I introduced at that point, we didn't have time to explain everything properly and going deep into those. So we are essentially revisiting those things and basically reinforcing the concepts. So this lecture will actually focus on what is known as closure problem of turbulence and why you need extra modeling if you are considering reacting flows. Okay. So, so far we already know this equation. This is our momentum conservation equation written for the instantaneous quantities. Now, if we carry out Reynolds decomposition for velocity and pressure, as you know that over bar means Reynolds average, prime means Reynolds fluctuation. The same equation takes this form, right? Happy with that? If you now actually take Reynolds average of that, you can consider for constant density flows, in the other words, incompressible flows, you know very well that if I have compressible flow or variable density flow, I can't actually use Reynolds decomposition. Based on yesterday's discussion, we should use favorite average favorite decomposition, right? So, henceforth, whenever you see me using Reynolds decomposition, please understand that I'm actually implicitly considering constant density flows or decompressible flows. If I take Reynolds average, this term will vanish. Mean of the fluctuation is zero, right? If I take average over this, already average so it will return the same value. If I take this one it will survive. If I take mean of this, this is already mean that will come out because of this part it will become zero because it's a mean of a fluctuation. Again same thing will happen to this it will vanish again. It is if I take average this portion will vanish because that's fluctuating pressure. And effectively, I can, the resulting equation that I'm going to get can be written in this manner. By any chance, you are starting to follow that. See, when I average this, this term appears, this term is non zero on averaging. I have just taken this term on the other side. Yeah. Now compare equation 3 with equation 1. You see this term looks like this term, isn't it? This term looks like this term. The only difference is this is in terms of written in terms of mean. This term also looks like this. Yeah. This one looks like this. But now I have got an extra term. That extra term involves correlation between velocity fluctuations. And that's an extra term. Effectively, it means if you just consider a fluid flow problem, no heat transfer, no chemical reaction, just a fluid flow problem. How many equations you are going to have? One mass conservation equation. If you are dealing with three dimensional flow, three momentum equation. How many variables you have? You have three velocity components and pressure. Right? If you consider a just a laminar flow, then you are going to deal with this equation, right? You have one mass conservation, three momentum conservation, 
four equations or four unknowns. It's a closed system. Now, if I'm dealing with mean velocities and mean pressure, I still have essentially the four equations for four variables, but I can't solve this without knowing this. Okay? Clear? Because as it stands, I can't solve this one because I don't have any information about how this term varies in terms of the mean quantities. Clear? And that effectively gives rise to the closure problem in turbulence. I will show later on in this lecture, you can tell that, okay, you can derive a transport equation for this one are essentially Reynolds stresses. What is stopping us? At the moment, if you look at this one, this quantity within the parenthesis, this is our Reynolds stress. It's a symmetric tensor. So it's a 3 by 3 tensor, but six independent components because it's a symmetric tensor. Okay? So I have got six unknowns. I'll just give you a hint, and you'll see that later on. If I actually derive a transport equation for this one, at the moment I have six extra unknowns. So if I consider my four mean variables, those are mean velocities in three directions, plus mean pressure, plus six, altogether 10 variables I have, I have only four equations. So I can't actually close this system. I have more variables than the number of equations that I have. If I write a transport equation for this, which I'll show later in this lecture, I'll have altogether 22 unknowns. Okay? So number of unknowns will proliferate as I go for more detailed things. How to actually then solve this problem? Very often, you actually express this term either in terms of algebraic closure. Algebraic closure means you are expressing this as a function of an algebraic expression in terms of the mean quantities. Okay? But please understand, I'm talking about model. That means approximation. Okay? So, outcome is that when you carry out the simulation, the accuracy of the simulation depends on how good your model is. So, when I'm talking about algebraic closure, that effectively means I'm going to go for a compromise and I'll be approximating the actual quantity by some kind of function in terms of the mean quantities. Okay? The alternative is, as I wrote, told earlier, you can actually come up with transport equation for this. In principle, in writing a transport equation, you are essentially considering all the physics involved in, in the evolution of this unclosed star, in this case, Reynolds the logic is clear. So if I now, this is my instantaneous equation, this is my mean equation, right? If I subtract, I'll get this equation for the fluctuating part of the velocity. There's a momentum equation for the fluctuating part of the velocity. If I interchange, ui to uj, the equation remains exactly the same, only the, the free exponent changes. Clear? Now, if I actually multiply this equation by uj dashed fluctuation in uj, 
multiply this one with EY prime. Effectively, by using chain rule, I can come up with this equation. And if I now Reynolds average this, this gives me this part of the equation. You can appreciate why this is zero because uj prime bar is equal to zero, ui prime bar is equal to zero. Okay? That gives me the transport equation for Reynolds stress. Okay? Now you can perhaps appreciate the problem. This term is unknown to me. It's an unclosed term. This part is closed, but this is again another unclosed. Okay? And all of these unclosed terms are valid for every component, every six component of Reynolds stress. So every six one of these six components will give rise to one unclosed term. So number of unclosed terms will increase significantly. Clear? Another thing to notice. Generally, when I'm talking about the correlation between two fluctuating quantities, it's called second moment. Right? Because essentially, we if you consider in statistics, the first moment is your mean, second moment is variance. Okay? So it basically gives you the second moment of the velocity fluctuations. If I write the transport equation for the second moment, it gives rise to an extra term which involves third moment. Clear? Now if you tell that, okay, I'll write even another transport equation for this, you can. Nobody stops you. Just by following the same methodology that I showed, you can actually come up with the transport equation for this. That will give rise to fourth moment and give rise to about 100 plus unclosed terms. So there is no end to it. It's the number of variables will grow as you go for higher moments and write down the transport equation. There will be no end to it. And that's why this poses a major problem in the analysis of carbon flows. Once you have understood this, then you actually go for an informed compromise tell that I will draw a line at a given stage. Now, where you are going to draw the line, that will depend upon your choice. You can tell that, if, look, I'm going to draw the thing that I'll come up with an algebraic expression for this part. And I'll be happy with that. It may not be that 100% accurate, but that's what I'm going to do. Clear? Yeah? Alternatively, you can tell, no, I am going to solve the transport equation. But please understand, you cannot solve this equation like this. This is unclosed term. All of these are unclosed terms. I told this part is closed. Why? Because you are already solving for mean quantity, so you should be able to evaluate that. Right? When you are solving for Reynolds stress, you will have access to these components of Reynolds stress. So this part is no. Okay? But you need closures for this one, this one, this one, and this one. Just to give you an idea, this part, effectively a pressure transport term, again, is a redistribution term. It's not really generating or destructing anything is basically taking things from one place putting it in another. This is also turbulent transport. Exactly the same thing which I told earlier is a redistribution term. It takes things from one place and puts them in another place. Okay? Redistributes the Reynolds stresses. 
molecular diffusion. These two terms are responsible for generation of Reynolds stresses and this is the molecular dissipation. Okay. If you take the trace of this tensor, you will get or in other words, if you take the trace of this system of partial differential equation, you will get exact expression for parallel magnetic tensor. Okay? Because twice of turbulent magnetic energy is Ui prime, Ui prime power. Clear? Now, another thing I want you to appreciate that if I have to actually use the model transport equation for the time being, if you consider that I have models for this, which people have come up with, you can solve this equation. But please understand, in that situation, you are actually solving six extra partial differential equations in addition to what you already have. That means computational cost goes up. Okay. The other thing you need to appreciate, it has all the necessary physics at this point. But I have already told it involves a number of unclosed terms. That means you need to have models there which you have to express either in terms of the mean quantities or in terms of the Reynolds traces. Okay? Model is the name for glorious, name for the approximation as I told you several times. As the number of terms which need to be modeled increased considerably now, although it has every important physics in built in this equation, we cannot tell a priori that all the modeling errors, how they are going to actually interact, it may not happen that all modeling, modeling errors are going to accumulate, going to accumulate. And essentially the outcome is what you are going to get is inferior to an algebraic closure. Okay? Keep that in mind. You are going for more computational cost, there is no guarantee a priori that is going to give you better results. Okay? Keep that in mind. <coughs> Anything is not clear. If we we have actually demonstrated it for the incompressible flow. Yesterday I showed the compressible form of the turbulent magnetic energy equation. There will be some extra unclosed terms here because of non-zero value of divergence of velocity. Just to remind yourselves, divergence of velocity is called dilatation rate. And that's going to be non-zero for compressible flows. Okay? Now, the same thing applies for reaction diffusion system. I'm just showing reaction diffusion system, so I'm basically moving to turbulent reacting flows, but for the time being, if you look at this equation, essentially that is the governing equation for an active scalar. What I meant by active scalar I mentioned on the first day, you have a source term sitting here, or seen term, whatever mind, depending upon the sign. If it is positive source, negative sink. Why active scalar? Because of the reaction rate, if it gives rise to heat release, that's going to affect the density, that will affect the velocity, that will affect the energy. If it gives rise to heat release, it will affect the energy equation, temperature will rise, that will give rise to change in density, that will also affect your momentum transport. So everything becomes coupled. So, although I am writing it for reaction diffusion system, you can have this kind of situation 
for other kind of flows as well. Even if you consider natural convection and consider this I as your temperature, temperature equation becomes an acting scalar equation in the case of natural convection because you will have an, an the coupled system because of the, the temperature giving rise to the velocity change. Okay? So if I consider now reaction diffusion system, turbulent reacting flow, that will give rise to see huge change in density. So now I am no longer using Reynolds decomposition. I am basically resorting to the Fabry decomposition. So here, Fabry mean Fabry fluctuation. Just to remind you, that's how they are defined. Phi prime bar is not equal to zero, but rho phi prime bar is equal to zero. <coughs> if I actually carry out the Fabry averaging operation, you will end up with this. I have not shown the derivation intentionally. You can do the derivation in a similar manner as I showed in the previous slides. Perhaps you can try it yourself. If you do Reynolds decomposition, the only difference will be here everything will be bar. This one is going to be single bar, single bar, and it is going to be whole over bar. Okay? Now, this part is called Reynolds scalar flux. Okay? Now, if you consider, I have, let's say, very simple system, a reacting flow system. I am carrying one, one species equation. And obviously, I have to now consider energy equation, right? So previously, I had four variables. Okay. Now I have four plus two, six variables. In a laminar flow situation, I have three momentum equation, one mass conservation equation, one energy equation, one species conservation equation. Six equations for six numbers. In turbulent flow, upon Reynolds averaging, I already got six extra Reynolds stresses. So now I am going to take three extra for scalar fluxes for the energy equation. There will be three scalar fluxes. For species equation, there will be another three. So for six quantities, now I'm going to get effectively six variables plus six Reynolds stresses, 12 plus three energy, Reynolds energy fluxes, plus three Reynolds scalar fluxes, so another six. So 18 variables, I have got six equations. Clear? Yeah. So again, I need to actually model them. Very often, people actually model them in this manner. This is commonly referred to as gradient hypothesis. Basically, if you think carefully, this is nothing but, if you consider this is some kind of heat flux, you are essentially considering as if it is Fourier's law of heat conduction. The functional relationship is like that. And this is the corresponding diffusion coefficient is related to the eddy diffusivity 
and something called sigma t, which is turbulent wind. If it is energy flux, this this thing is going to be called turbulent Prandtl number. This Prandtl number is a material property, but Schmidt number is a material property, but turbulent Schmidt number and turbulent Prandtl number, these are basically modeling variables. They are not material property. Okay. Typically, people use a variable, uh, sorry, a value close to one for this one. But to be honest, there are situations where this kind of model actually fails miserably. And there are situations with reacting flows where scalar flux does not behave in a gradient manner. That means, according to this, this part is positive, right? If it is positive, it is positive. Schmidt number, turbulent Schmidt number is positive. So this part is positive. So effectively, this equation suggests that diffusion, turbulent diffusion takes place from the high concentration region to the low concentration region. That's what this negative sign ensures, right? But there are situations, especially in reacting groups, just the opposite thing happens. Clear? So whatever I have said so far, all of these things are going to be, be useful for natural convection as well. But one thing to remember, that in the case of natural convection, there will be no source term for that energy equation. Because the source term appears in the particle velocity momentum equation, then that's how it is basically an active scalar because the temperature change can change the velocity in that case. Clear? Now, I'm coming back to combustion or any reactive flow. Generally, if I consider only two scalars, let's say fuel and oxidizer, this source term depends on their mass fractions. I've just given a very, very simple uh, expression. Y1 is the mass fraction of one of the species. Y2 is the mass fraction for another species. If you can consider one to be fuel, two to be oxidizer, if you want. There is no requirement. This is just going to be Y1 times Y2. Depending upon the chemical mechanism, you can have Y1 raised to the power some exponent, Y2 raised to the power some other exponent. And this is a major problem. You have an exponential dependence on temperature. T, A, C is called activation temperature. And this is your temperature. So you can clearly appreciate just looking at the functional form, at least qualitatively, it's a highly nonlinear function of temperature. And the averaging of works on top of it. So essentially, it is not going to be A rho bar, Y1 bar, Y2 bar, exponential minus T activation divided by T bar. It's not going to work like that. Okay? And that really poses a major issue for the modeling of turbulent reacting flows. Now, for the scalar flux, once again you can actually come up with a transport equation. And people have tried that. Instead of actually using this kind of algebraic closure, you can understand why it's algebraic closure, because effectively you are just giving one expression in terms of the mean variable. You are solving for the mean variable. It is just a simple expression. <coughs> Here? But if you don't want to do that, you want to actually solve a transport equation. This has given rise to this term, which is closed. You can see, just like Reynolds momentum flux, 
So our scalar flux is also a second moment. It's a correlation between the velocity fluctuation and the scalar fluctuation. But its transport equation has given rise to third moment. Okay. This term essentially is responsible for turbulent transport of scalar flux. Doesn't generate or destroy anything. It basically is a redistribution term. It takes something from one place, puts in another place. Okay. This two term, this one, in the context of second moment closure, is a closed term because you are already solving for the Reynolds stress. Mean variable, mean scalar value is already known, so you should be able able to actually evaluate this contribution without any model. Any, any extra model. Obviously, you need model for this. Okay? This term is also closed because you are already solving for this. And mean velocity will be available to you anyway. So you don't need any extra modeling. But these two give rise to generation of scalar flux. This is due to the mean scalar gradient, due to mean velocity gradient. Clear? These two are effectively responsible for redistribution of scalar flux because of pressure. Once again, do not generate this drop. Just redistribute. Now, we have got T6 and T7. T6 and T7 are all together called dissipation term. What it means, if the scalar flux behaves like a gradient type, it shows gradient type behavior, these two terms together tries to actually bring it down to, and tries to tend towards the counter gradient behavior. If the scalar flux tries to walk like a counter gradient behavior, it tries to, these two terms try to promote gradient type of behavior. It just tries to oppose. Okay? They basically we originate because of the velocity fluctuation and the molecular diffusion fluctuation contribution. And similarly between the because of the scalar fluctuation and the momentum diffusion fluctuation contribution. And this is the contribution because of the reaction. You can clearly see the ones which are unclosed, maybe this one is unclosed, these two are unclosed, these two are unclosed, this is unclosed. Okay? So for one unclosed term, you have got one, two, three, four, five, six unclosed terms. If you are thinking about three scalar flux components, three times six, eighteen unclosed terms. Okay? Your overall outcome of the simulation will depend on how you have modeled these eighteen terms accurately. It's a tall order, isn't it? You can define a derived transport equation for scalar flux for incompressible flow following exactly the same strategy. This term will go to zero because this will become high prime bar. Obviously, fluctuation, mean of a fluctuation will go to zero. Okay? But obviously, in the context of favorite fluctuation, this is not zero. Just to remind you. It goes to zero once you actually get situated. But that's not there. Here, actually, this term plays a very, very important role in turbulent reacting flows like combustion processes, which, and this term is actually not there in the incompressible flow. So when you are actually considering simulating a reacting flow and you are using a model which was originally developed for T4 plus T5 for incompressible flow, please be careful. 
because that's going to ignore a major problem. Clear so far? Now, let's actually revisit the modeling of the chemical reaction with the assault stuff. Let's say a very generic chemical reaction. Okay? One unit mass of fuel, case unit mass of oxidizer. Obviously, mass remains constant for chemical reaction. I'm sure you have done that in chemistry. So it gives one plus this mass of unit mass of products. Happy? It's a balanced chemical reaction, concentrated that. So yes is often referred to as stoichiometric oxygen to mass uh, fuel mass ratio. Let's say my fuel reaction rate is even in this one. I have considered this as a fuel reaction rate magnitude, that's why I did not put any sign. Magnitude means positive that, right? You consider fuel reaction rate actually is going to have a negative sign because fuel is being consumed. Clear? Yeah? So if I actually write the, uh, the reaction rate of oxygen, it is going to be S times of that because one unit fuel consumes S unit of oxidizer. Clear? Yeah? If I write it for the product, it is going to be one plus S times this. Okay. Now, let's say this is my expression. If I now consider that I am going to express all of these things based on the expansion prime t as t tilde plus t double prime, tft tilde plus t double prime, you can essentially put whatever yf as yf tilde plus Y F double prime, Y O tilde Y O double prime. We're going to get this, which is essentially a grand mess. There is no end to it. Okay? If you want to actually consider this, that means you are going to actually consider all of these terms to be negligible. Generally, that's not valid for any conventional combustion processes. There are certain chemical processes where you can make that kind of strong assumption. Atmospheric chemistry, whatever happens in atmosphere, it happens so slowly, these correlations are not strong, you can perhaps control. But in most combustion processes or most industrial chemical reaction processes, you can't know these things. So then you suddenly have a major issue. Here there will be a bar sign. I don't know why it's not coming. If it is not there, please put it. Because this is essentially the mean reaction. And P and Q are given like this. So, it actually gives rise to a huge number of unclosed terms due to the non-linear temperature dip dependence and the, the mass fraction dependences on reaction rate. As I said, atmospheric boundary layer supersonic flows, this equation perhaps can work by actually dropping some of these terms. But in general, you cannot really use that equation for the purpose of order of this. Clear? So, this is really the summary of this. W dot F, the reaction rate, is a function of Yf, Yot. This is for this, but that's not equal to that. So, 
what you actually do, you basically completely bypass the problem and approach it from a different perspective. Where you, one possibility is, this is often adopted in premise combustion modeling, you tell that I'm not going to actually close my reaction rate directly the way the reason is just what we discussed, right? I need to tell that instead I'm going to model the surface area to the volume ratio. Why that will give me the same quantity? I have to make another assumption. I'll consider the reactant consumption per unit area remains same as the laminar frame. Okay? So effectively this quantity is consumption rate per unit volume. If I have surface area divided by volume and I tell that consumption rate per unit surface area is same as laminar flame. So I already know that laminar flame calculation. And if I have surface area to volume, then I can actually multiply the consumption rate per unit area from the laminar flame with the surface area to volume ratio. Then I get this quantity. Clear? Basically not this quantity, mean. Clear? Happy with that? So, this is one of the things. This is another one. This is generally used in the case of non-premix combustion because when fuel and oxidizer are separated from each other, the flame is established where you have a stoichiometric mixture, which stoichiometric mixture means is that the relative proportions are determined by a balanced chemical reaction. Okay. So I can actually solve for another scalar which is a passive scalar which basically tracks the mixing process and wherever I have the stoichiometric mixture fraction location, but wherever I have the stoichiometric mixture, that's where my flame sinks. Okay? So generally, this is essentially whether you consider RAMS or LDS. So far, I talked about RAMS in this lecture, but the procedure remains exactly the same. Effectively, you start with an unclosed quantity. You can either go for algebraic closure or transporting closure. Then, obviously, you have to go for the validation of the model. That bit is common. Alternatively, when, if you are going for transport, you have to find out how the statistical behavior of the unclosed terms are likely to be. You have to actually, sometimes you can do a scaling analysis to estimate the order of magnitudes of those terms. Obviously, you have seen that writing a transport equation gives rise to a proliferation of, the, of unknown variables. If you can drop some of those terms, an order of magnitude analysis will enable you to do that. And then you actually go for the modeling of the terms. Obviously, I did not show it, but you need to actually validate the model anyway. The only difference is for the case of LES, in RANS, the model coefficients that you have got, they remain constant. That means once you have chosen them, the value does not change. Unless you have expressed them function of some and other quantities. But there is a possibility in LES, depending upon the local flow feature, based on the local flow feature, you actually change the model. And that happens in a dynamic manner. As the simulation progresses, based on the, the local filtered values, 
you actually carry out some analysis based on the local filtered values, which you already get from the solution, sometimes you then filter that filtered quantity. That's the only time you need to bother about filtering in actual areas. And based on that, you actually estimate your model cost. Okay? So your model constant can be different at every time step or every iteration. And that is determined by the local flow physics. And that's called the dynamic model. Now, one more thing I want to actually tell. I told yesterday that LES essentially is somewhere between RANS and DNS. And modeling implications are less severe in the context of LES because you are already resolving some of the result, uh, you are resolving some of the time energy. Only a small part remains to resolve. The part which is unresolved shows anyway an universal behavior. So I don't need to actually bother about how my flow configuration looks like. I can universally model that. All those comments which I made are strictly valid for non-reacting flows. In the case of chemical reaction, especially in typical combustion processes, the flame thickness is often really, really small. So actually, flame thickness is going to be smaller than your filter weights for all practical purposes. So whole of the chemical process is taking place at the subgrade level. You are not resolving anything there. If you are doing LES of a reactive flow, effectively all chemical processes are taking place in the subgrade level. Okay? So the, you might do a good job in terms of representing the fluid flow part in the case of LES, but chemical processes you are not resolving anyway. So in that sense, between LES and RANS, there is no difference. So prediction of the chemical reaction rate in LES will have same challenges as that of RANS. Now, obviously, I have told several times, it's a fully coupled system. If you actually make a wrong prediction of reaction rate, you will have a wrong prediction of heat release that will affect the energy conservation equation, that means your temperature prediction will be wrong. If temperature prediction is wrong, if density field gets polluted, if density field is polluted, your velocity field goes polluted as well. So please understand the advantage of LES is severe in the case of non-reacting flows. In reacting flows, the same challenges as that of RANS also exist for LES. But yes, there is a possibility for better representation of the fluid mechanics because at least fluid mechanics perspective, you are resolving somewhat the turbulent magnetic field perspective. Effectively, if you ask me between RAMS and LES, very often the models for LES are essentially extended from RAMS. At least from the, from the perspective of uh, reacting flows. Where you have large scale unsteadiness in your problem, LES actually gives you better predictions. But sometimes, if that feature is not there, it is not necessary that you have to go for LES. It is going to be a significant benefit to your programs. Okay? So, hopefully, now you can appreciate what the closure problem of turbulence from where it comes from. Okay? The need for modeling Reynolds stresses and fluxes. Motivation for why combustion modeling is needed. So effectively, if you are going for reacting flow, modeling of turbulence is not sufficient. On top of that, you have to do combustion modeling. The reaction. 
basically that's the modeling of the source of seed time. Okay. There are different routes, and I leave you with this cartoon. I think that represents your concerns yesterday. I think at the end of today's tutorial, hopefully you will alleviate your concerns in that respect. Dinner's break for the day.